Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm gonna say hello seekers. I'm gonna address my audience as seekers. I like the, the term. So hello seekers. We are with Evan Watkins today. Uh, Evan is the is a senior content strategist at VDX and the author of uh, Team Emotion Intelligence. Um, so yeah, I'm super duper excited to talk to him. Um, and so hi Evan. Hey, it's going to be fun. Um, I love your list of questions. So I'm excited to dive in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this one, I'm kind of like feel more relaxed about it because I don't know. I feel like this is the one I'm prepared the most for. If that makes sense. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. But anyways, let's hit it. So let's start with the standard questions. So uh, let's do it. Okay. So Evan, is there something uh, you looked for but couldn't find? Something I looked for. Yeah, I think something I looked for that, like, but I couldn't find. I feel like I spent a lot of my my like teenage into my early 20s kind of like looking for danger whether that was like in surfing or uh in other act like kind of outdoor activities and i was never able to find it like like the ability to really engage with it myself if that makes sense like i was always kind of uh more fearful than i wanted to be so i guess i was looking for courage maybe is the, you said the first word you said danger yeah danger like like okay. i felt like i would seek out danger like i would try to surf like big waves and i would uh yeah try to do things like that and i never really found it so so like are you an adrenaline junkie or something no i think i think or you I was want trying, to become one i was yeah maybe not an adrenaline junkie but i was trying to like push my limits and like experience what those were and I had trouble like pushing them as far as I wanted to like I never really felt like I found that why why did I want to no why didn't you be able to push them uh as far as you could I don't know I think maybe it's like a matter of courage or like something that's natural to me but it was really difficult to like, Which was not true to you. Uh, I think I, it was more natural to like work at my own pace uh, and to like when I found myself like I'll just I'll talk about surfing because I think that was the main way that I was doing this is like if I were to surf like a big wave like if the waves are really big if it got like too big, I would find myself like I would want to surf one spot, but I would ultimately like not do it. <laughs> right. Um, so I think it's like a matter of courage or like comfort level, maybe. Uh, like I was more more of a creature of comfort than I wanted to admit. And how how um, are you comfortable now with this that you are a creature of comfort? Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I think I've accepted it a lot more than I did at the time. Like I felt, I think that's what it is. That's a good question. Cause I think what it was, was that I thought that I wanted danger and I realized that I like, didn't actually want it through time. Right. Uh, okay. And now I, was... I realize, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, that was all. <laughs> No, because it, 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 what you're saying somewhat resonates because I never kind of, okay, I never kind of sought intentionally to, to kind of step outside of my comfort zone uh, or seek danger. Uh, and throughout the years, now I'm kind of like, accept, I accept the fact that one of my values is actually comfort, not uh seeking danger and uh, i think it's part of our culture now there's kind of a 
a lot glorifying uh, risk taking and seek, uh, seeking danger and all of that stuff. And for yeah. them, it works and good for them. But I personally think it's important to know, like, to see what works for you. Um, so I'm very happy. Yeah, I'm very comfortable now to say, like, you know, yeah, stability is uh, something that I, I want in my life. Um, so, yeah. Um, so the let's let's talk about hidden gems. Uh, yeah. What hidden gems have you discovered in your life? Yeah, it's funny. I had a the like. There's this crazy overlap between. I was like looking at that question, and then you had tagged me on LinkedIn for. Uh, there was like this question about organizing your notes. Right. And. Uh, I guess we both follow animals and I want to say like six months ago, Ryan Law, who's like their, I think VP of content strategy yeah. or, or something. Yeah. He yeah. had posted about this book called how to take smart notes. Right. And it's all about this like big note taking system that as you like read and intake information, instead of like what I had always done before was I would like, if I was working on a project, I would take notes in like one document and keep them all in this one place. And like this book teaches you that when you do that, you're actually like, you're like playing to the natural weaknesses in our brain because, because you're like intentionally avoiding all the like cool coincidences of ideas intersecting. Right. And like the whole premise of this book is to take notes in like a broader system so that every time you take a note, it has a chance to intersect with like a different note that you would have never thought that it would intersect with. Right. Um, and so for me, that was like such a hidden gem. I'd never heard of this book. Um, I don't know anyone who's heard of it. And like, since I started doing it, it's totally changed my approach to writing and like, uh, yeah, so it's called How to Take Smart Notes is the name of the book. And you discovered this after that you're done your master's in creative writing. Yeah, yeah, it was after, afterward. <laughs> okay, so why do you think was it hidden to begin with? Like, why why is it not known more, you know? Yeah, like what made it hidden? Yeah. I, I think, like, note-taking is just not a very, uh, it's like a subject that not very many people are interested in. And you're like, everyone feels like they know how to take notes or like they're not that interested right. in taking notes. But I think, oh. I think like it's the system underneath notes that's actually so valuable in this book. And so I think right. it's hidden because, because it's like a topic that feels dry and feels kind of dull. But once you actually get into the book, you realize like, no, this is a book about thinking. This is a book about like how you can think for the rest of your life and how you can build a system to think. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I think I would be, you know, if you, one of the questions I thought about for myself, like what is something that I wish I knew before? And one of them would be like these things about note-taking, definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know the 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 kind of relationship between creative versus analytical thinking when it comes to writing. That sometimes you know, sometimes our brain cannot do both at the same time. Um, so yeah, um, have you read Tim Metz, also a writer at um, Animals, the six? Uh, I think six. Let me think. It's about note taking as well. Let me. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was referring to. It's was that you tagged me. You had tagged right. me in a post about how do you take notes, and then yeah, I saw yeah. you had commented below that about that Tim Metz article. Um, oh, I thought I thought you had uh, you had read the book before before that. You I had yeah because Ryan Ryan Law had posted about that book on Twitter like six months before, but I'm guessing there's like some connection there where either Tim Metz told him to read it or oh, okay. vice versa. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Um, sure, sure, sure. So I had already read it and started doing that note-taking system, 
but I was like, I read Tim Metz's article as well. And he proposes like kind of a third system that's different from the book I just referenced. Right. Where, okay. Because his system is where like all notes are created equal. And then you can go in and like develop that note if you think it's like worthy of further development. So it's like really similar to how to take smart notes, but I think the how to take smart notes system has a, like a note has to be worthy of your box to get to like get into your system in the first place. Right. And Tim Metz's system is every note you take like in the margins of a book is in your box. Right. Right, right. Um, have yeah. you heard of uh, spaced, repet spaced repetition not spaced repetition um, uh, let me see for a sec Space. incremental writing incremental writing no. okay it's another system of uh, writing uh, based on um uh, Space repetition. repetition. Uh, I'm not going to get into this now, but I have a friend who kind of like, not special, he's a, a super memo addict. So if you're interested in a connection, I can connect you, uh, but we'll leave it after the session. What, what did you say it was called? Spa space repetition? Uh, so the, the system is called uh, incremental. Okay. Incremental writing. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, okay, what is something you change your mind about? Well, I think like as of one and a half years ago, I was planning to go to school to become a therapist. And I spent a lot of time thinking about like kind of, I, I imagine my life, I'd split between like being a therapist and writing novels. And uh, I think because I got like, I started doing work in an office where I was like writing the majority of the time. And I realized that like, I just love writing and that even if I like enjoyed doing therapy that I would wish I was writing probably the whole time. So. <laughs> Did you do any kind of uh, practice uh, with therapy? No, um, but I was like, I, my undergraduate major in college was psychology. Right. And then I've worked in like organizational psychology with talent smart, um, emotional intelligence and things like that. But I, d I never even reached the point of like, uh, doing practice therapy or anything like that. Okay, okay. Uh, read some books. <laughs> right, right, right. That's what I got. Uh, okay. So, okay, so I, I want you to think of someone you intensely do not like. Uh, don't mention the name. Now, yeah. <laughs> tell me, all the positive things about them and, you know, try to convince me as much as possible that they're uh, not as bad as I, as you think. And... All right. Hmm. Well, they have a really strong mind for like systems. Uh, so if they were like, like they would be a great, like operational kind of person in a business to have because yeah. they can like, uh, they can like divide tasks and like manage a project probably like better than anyone. Um, and they like, de they definitely care for their family and their friends and like, they care about having fun. I would say right. those are my, and I think those are a lot of like important values and interesting skills to have. So how, how did it feel the, uh, the, the thought, ex this thought experiment? Or maybe already um, do this type of thing. I think it's good. I it, it feels pretty good for me because it it kind of slows you down. Like I think 
with people at like with someone you don't like you almost go on like autopilot when you think about them uh like your like initial reaction is just like oh i don't like this person i don't want to think about them or like yeah. or like you have these like negative emotions and you just move on um but actually taking the time to slow down and think what's good about this person or uh or or just like who is this person even <laughs> like on a more basic right. level slows yeah. you down and like makes you think less about maybe the events that transpired between you and more about just the fact that they're like a real person. Right, right, right. Okay, uh, now think of your ideal work partner and uh, tell me how are they similar or dif uh, and different from you? Hmm. I feel like maybe the closest I've got to an ideal work partner was on like the recent book we wrote, the Team Emotional Intelligence 2.0 like a, a co-authorship is like kind of a really intense process to go through with someone. Like writing a book is already a big, like a big undertaking mentally. And then partnering with someone else, I think can go like really badly. <laughs> like I've heard examples of it going really badly. And my experience was so positive, um, like on so many levels. And so I'll, ju I'll describe it. So her name's um, Dr. Jean Greaves, and she was the, the co-author. She was the founder of Talent Smart, and she founded it 20 years ago, built the company, has been researching emotional intelligence since even before that, um, has her PhD in psychology. She's like built assessments around emotional intelligence. So she has this vast, like really vast experience that I don't have. Uh, and she had sort of a vision in mind for the structure of the book. And I was like helping her follow that structure, you know, and like uh, do the writing. And I think like what, I, I think there's two things I can think of that really made her like an ideal work partner. And the first is that like, she loves ideas and we could like, waste hours just talking about potential ideas for the book <laughs> and and we always had a ton of fun doing that um and i think it ended up like it resulted in some really cool sections and examples and studies that that like made their way into the book and then i think the second thing that made her an ideal work partner was when we were editing the book we would do like like what you and I are doing right now, it'd be a Zoom session. Uh, we'd, except we'd like screen share the book and, and just go through edits like page by page together um, and kind of challenge each other. And the way that like she both gave and received feedback, I felt like we had a really close partnership on the book yeah. where, um, if we disagreed on like a sentence or an idea, we would go back and forth and we could always in real time figure out like where we, where we landed on that sentence and how we wanted to move forward. And, uh, and there are never really hard feelings about it. Like we always, we could agree in real time. So it was pretty impressive. Um, I'm very interested in the issue of co-authoring thing. And I, I it has a bit about how, like the different models for it. So some people have like different chapters. So each person will take a chapter. Uh, and then there's another uh, format where it's different iterations. So one would be the first draft, the second draft. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, from what I'm hearing with you, it's she was the big picture uh, person and you were the kind of a, the execution person? Yeah, so so it was like, it's part of, the book is part of, I wouldn't call it a series, but Talent Smart has these books that it, they call them like the 2.0s. So there's like Emotional Intelligence 2.0, Leadership 2.0, and now there's, the book we just wrote is Team Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Um, and the 2.0, denotes the fact that it's like a strategy-based book. 
so like the majority of the book is devoted to giving you strategies to practice to improve your emotional intelligence your leadership your team eq yeah um and so i guess where the, what i'm saying with this is we knew the structure of the book because we were mirroring the structure of emotional intelligence 2.0 and leadership 2.0 right. um so yeah so we had the we had the vision for the whole structure in place already and that was based on the books that Gene had written in the past. Right. Uh, and so then to go back to the co-authorship question, we knew the structure. We also had a team of people contributing. So we have uh, facilitators at TalentSmart who go on site to different companies and train emotional intelligence. Um, and so we had three of them contribute strategies to the book. We had our CEO contributed strategies. Um, and so we had like this whole collection of people contributing strategies to the book. And so Gene and I worked with those people to edit their strategies and get them like ready for book, like ready for publication. Sure. Um, and then to go all the way back to your original point, we also, for the early chapters in the book, we each took a turn at like first draft. So like I wrote chapter one, Gene wrote two and three. And then like when we finished them, we would switch. And that's when we would meet and like start editing sentences and ideas. Right, 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 right. All right. So, so yeah, kind of a combination of the two that you mentioned where it's yeah. like uh, Gene had kind of the structural vision, but we also like divided the chapters and then spent a ton of time revising each other's chapters as well. Right. Uh, okay, if you can facilitate a conversation between any two people, uh, alive or dead, who would you choose? Such a big question. I, I think I'll probably sit here like all day trying to think of the the two people. So I'll I'll give you like two people that come to mind quickly right. sure um like two of my favorite writers of all time are virginia wolf and james joyce right uh, who also like coincidentally lived the exact same years uh wow like i, I want to like say like born in the same year and the died in the same year yeah I, I can't remember the year they were born but they both died in 1941 okay and they're they're born in the late 1880s. Okay. And there's a ton of like interesting kind of overlap between their work. Like they, they both were on the forefront of experimenting with stream of conscious writing in fiction. So right. like where where a character is kind of th like thinking in the writing, or at least it feels that way. Uh, like capturing thought process in fiction. Right. Uh, but then when interviewed about James Joyce, like Virginia Woolf's only comment was like that his writing was gross because he like writes about poop or something like that. And uh, I just think, I just think that was like kind of dodging the question on her part. And I think she's genuinely like, I think they influenced each other and I'd love to like sit them down at dinner and make them read passages to each other and like critique them. <laughs> I love that. Um, I love this answer. Uh, uh, oh, wow. What, well, you know what he, what was his kind of opinion of her writing? Did he say anything about her writing? I'm not sure. Okay. Did he just remind me of the, so I, James Joyce was he in uh, Ireland or? Yeah. So James Joyce is from Ireland and, and he wrote from, like. Okay. And yeah, and then um, Virginia Woolf's from England. Okay. Right. Oh, this is super interesting. I'm going to check it out after we finish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that is cool. Yeah, To the Lighthouse is like my favorite book of all time. Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. Uh, it's beautiful. Right. Right. So let me ask you, okay, this is something that was not planned, but since it, it was mentioned, um, now I, I, it's one of my Eureka moments, actually. Um, you know what? Okay. 
Did you notice anything when you were reading biographies of writers? Did you have any kind of like, oh, wow, there's something, there's a certain similarity that's, or there's a disturbing trend among writers. Did you ever say, wow, this is kind of strange. <laughs> Did you ever uh, have like from reading about different biographies? Yes. Yeah, I think there's like, there's so many interesting trends and themes. Uh, I mean, an obvious one is like alcoholism was so big for so long in writers. And uh, I, I heard this theory that I think is really funny. I don't necessarily think it's true, but I think it's funny, uh, which is that less writers are alcoholics now because of television <laughs> because all they were looking to do is it was like uh, after writing for a full day they just needed to, to like turn their brain off and so like the theory is that with television you can turn your brain off without alcohol <laughs> right gotcha. i don't know if it's that true but i, th I think it's kind of interesting because uh, you know, the reason I'm asking this is it's because one of the, one of my kind of uh, most entertaining, not entertaining, just memorable Eureka moments for me. So as I was growing up, I was reading, uh, you know, the biographies of uh, writers like Virginia Woolf. Did she kind of drown herself? Yeah. She drowned herself. Then Sylvia, Sylvia Plath. Something about uh, shoot, uh, the gal. She put her head in an oven. And then Hemingway shot himself. I'm like, this is, is this not like what's happening here? Uh, so in my mind, it was like this question was like in my mind in the subconscious. And then later on, when I was taking um, psychology, uh, so that was, I think, was in high school. But then in university and college, uh, I took about uh, took a course on uh, bipolar uh, on uh, I think the course was more uh, it, it it had a section on bipolar disorder and it mentioned that there were there's an uh, there's an overlap between being creative and bipolar disorder, and at mm -hmm. the same time, uh, bipolar disorder has the highest a suicide rate because in the Romania, uh, uh, in the, uh, the, they can be very impulsive. Um, so the link was that's the hypothesis is that what is common that that having bipolar makes you both very creative, which manifests itself in writing, and at the same time uh, prone to uh, suicide. So that's why yeah. uh, that, that would fit in with um with substance abuse also. Like I'm, I think there's um a relationship between bipolar disorder and substance abuse as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh and I'm not I'm gonna say this thing something now, but disclaimer, I'm not uh, advising anyone to do this. I've heard that some writers would win all, when they have uh, when they're on medication, but they want to like continue a novel or continue writing, that we, they take themselves off medication so that they get their uh, creative fuels back so that they can end, you know, the, it, uh, but again, uh, wow. don't do that or. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's go with uh, the custom questions I sent you. So, how uh, do you balance between intrigue and clarity on your writing? Before you answer, I want to explain where I'm coming from. Okay. So one of the kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Biggest principles of content marketing is that you have to be clear, 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 clear. And everything, you know, is skimmable and, you know, to the point, blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, I, Malcolm Gladwell, one of my favorite writers is Malcolm Gladwell, and he says he, he his style has this um, element of tantalizing the person in front of you, where you 
uh, kind of like mention something, but you allude to it and then come to it later, uh, or uh, you know you, you you create intrigue in uh, in the mind of the, yeah. uh, of the reader. So I always have this kind of conflict between me trying to kind of uh, create intrigue where it's entertaining and they, they, they want to read more, but at the same time, I want them to understand what I'm saying. So how did, for number one, did you experience, did you struggle with this? And number two, how do you balance between? Yeah. Yeah. I, had, I, I guess I never thought of the struggle as between intrigue and clarity but I definitely struggle with both. <laughs> uh, right. I think, I, I guess the way I see it is that like intrigue is very much about hinting at something bigger and not giving it right away. And, and clarity is about when you have an idea or an example or a scene or even an image, communicating it uh, in a way that's understood, understood meaning like understood the way that you see and think about it yourself. Um, and so to me, building intrigue, I, I almost think about it like, uh, <laughs> it, it's almost like, like a five paragraph essay, like a classic essay where your thesis is meant to draw intrigue, right? Like you have some idea that you present to the reader and your idea suggests something bigger than just that sentence. And then you start to explore it. And as you explore it, you should be building it, right? Like you should be calling back to that idea that built intrigue and you're slowly building up to something bigger. Um, and I think that's what, that's how you balance intrigue and clarity, right? So it's like you're building intrigue and you're exploring your idea in a clear way. Uh, but as you clearly explore elements of that idea, you're calling back to the initial intrigue to show that like, we're starting to work at it, but we haven't figured it out kind of thing. Right. Uh, I mean, that's one way to do it. <laughs> it's writing, so there's a hundred ways to do it, but that's yeah. how I've been thinking about it a lot, especially in nonfiction. Yeah, fiction no, I'm a different world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I'm, I'm wondering if there's also the, an, an, uh, an issue of difference of, uh, of reader. So like, because that, that bit where like, um, one of the content marketing tips, at least from, that I read, at least from animals, the same guy, the um, and Mets. Uh, nope. Uh, Iron Law. Iron Law. Uh, that you shouldn't, you, you kind of shouldn't bury the lead at the end. You just like have to put it right off the bat. Uh, mm -hmm. Which makes sense if your goal is not, as a reader, my, I'm, I'm not reading to be entertained. I'm reading to because I have a problem and or I want to answer to my my problem. So, but if you're reading like if I'm reading a Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, then I'm not necessarily looking for a solution to a problem. I'm you know I'm just exploring and 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 this technique of like leaving it till the end might be uh, appropriate. Yeah, or I think. Um... I'm trying to think about both of them because they they sort of approach things so differently but like animals is a lot of tactical writing or like strategic writing so it's like how do you do this like big note-taking process for example is like that one article and so for them building intrigue at the beginning is being like is kind of like okay let's shatter your notion of how you've always taken notes and show you that there's like a better way. Right. And so that builds intrigue because you're like, wow, I've been doing notes this way my whole life. And there's this whole other way. And then the intrigue stays throughout the article, even though you already told them the whole thing, 
right because you need to get into how to actually do that right and so i think that's where the intrigue comes in that example and then in malcolm gladwell he might raise like a bigger question like he's very like i i think like philosophical or um so raise a psychological question of like if this happens how is that possible right and so then he's exploring the question is how i think of his writing a lot of the time so he starts applying that question to a story or to a study or to a personal example from his life and each time he applies it he's progressing on that question he's making progress on that question and so the intrigue comes from like where is he going to land on this question yeah. uh, and each paragraph still has intrigue because it's a new angle and so that's why i think like malcolm gladwell it sometimes feels like a shotgun spray like you're like where is he going with this but there's that initial question and so even though you have all these like scattered uh ideas you know they're coming together and you can see how they relate back to that initial question yeah i love that i love that. that's a that was a brilliant answer i love how you explored the different vegan books well i love the how you can the you can say something from the very beginning but you mean uh people to remain cu curious to see how the how um yeah <laughs> my friend uh cleared my friend she um I was talking to her about Malcolm Gladwell, and she she's a big reader. She's like, and she's not a fan at all. She's like, this guy needs an editor. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you kind of also, I, I, I remember we talked about Malcolm Gladwell before and you're a fan, but you have any friends who are not really like appreciative of uh, his style? Oh, I actually, I really love his style. For me, I don't know. I don't, I don't think of him a ton on like the sentence level right. as much as like he's like the non-fiction guy who the way he brings like studies and stories to life is incredible and that's what I really fix it on and I think I think of that as his style like he's the guy who will who can come up with like 15 examples of the same question uh all of them original from the other one and all of them pushing the question further um, yeah, I, if I were to critique him, I, I think sometimes he's so good at it that he loses like, uh, the original point of the study. Like there's the classic thing with like the 10,000 hour rule right? where he took this study on teenagers playing violin and by like Anders Ericsson and found that the best ones had practiced for 10,000 hours. And so then he takes that and starts applying it to mastery of any, of like anything. <laughs> uh, and the original author of the study was like, oh no, that's not really like a fair conclusion to draw. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, like the reader has some degree of responsibility to parse through the information as well i think the writer does too like i think he went a little too far with drawing that connection right. um but i also think like the right the reader has some responsibility to be like uh that's a big jump like that's a big leap yeah. and and like what do i want to take from it right so right. it's like i'm not gonna like start tracking my hours now and be like once i hit ten thousand, i'll be a master uh, right. <laughs> at whatever i do like you have to like think through what he's really saying, which is that like, there's a baseline number of hours that you need to reach to really like, to like reach the level that other people are at. And like, uh, yeah, so. Uh, that's actually this incident. Uh, I actually wrote a post about this. I had almost like an identity crisis when I went through this. It's like, because I had them uh, marking that in such high esteem. But yeah. like more important for me is like the accuracy of what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, good. When I, when I, it was kind of like confusing when I, when I first kind of almost canned this. Um, but for me, like he's more, in, he's, uh, and he would say that, I think he's, he's more of a storyteller rather than, 
someone who is super concerned about the facts of things. Uh, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, I typically, uh, personally, I, I, I can't. You know, I think the facts are just as important. Um, but I kind of appreciate, especially if you explicitly say that, like, guys, I'm, you know, I'm just telling a story type of thing. Um, so, yeah, anyways. I think, yeah, I have a couple of thoughts about that. that that's interesting. I, th I think, like, the first thing I think about is, uh, is, like, there's a way to have done exactly what he did and framed it better. Um, I don't remember how he frames it in the book, but like when you make the jump to calling it the 10,000 hour rule, like describe your thought process and its flaws <laughs> also right. as you coined the term, right? Like be like, I'm calling this the 10,000 hour rule, but what if it's something that's brand new and you're one of the first people doing it? It's going to be less than 10,000 hours, right? Like uh, counter argue yourself as you present your idea and i think you don't lose that much because it's still a great idea right uh so i don't think you lose very much and you gain a lot by by um by showing your thought process there like i actually yeah. think it makes it more interesting if anything yeah yeah um and then and then my other thought is just that like you're saying he, he's not so concerned with the facts as he is with the stories and i think what goes along with the stories is like ideas. He's a, he's an, a big picture idea guy. Um, and so what he does is, you know, sometimes he might get the facts wrong by accident. Um, but I think he pushes ideas forward. Like, I don't think like that was an old study that the Anders Ericsson one about violin practice and i don't think that study would have like seen the light of day the way that it did without his work yeah he's the popular so, yeah yeah and so if yeah he's a popularizer and, and if popularizer. he hadn't written that then there never even would have been this debate <laughs> about ten thousand hours and because he made this big statement then psychologists were able to come in and be like here's how you're wrong and why and then his idea became up here like his idea went a lot further i think like mastery is now this huge topic. Yeah. I mean, my my approach would be, okay. I understand what I'm saying, but I'd rather I'd rather have like a disclaimer on his books. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm just saying some stories, like don't take me too seriously, type of thing. Uh, uh, then, 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 then just like, because that's the thing, you know, if you sat with him and talked, okay, that's fine. But lots of people, especially people who are not, don't know much about academia, don't know much about research methodology. If they pick their book, the, they have this impression coming in that, you know, this is, this is the truth type of thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which is how books are treated around the world is like. Right. Uh, because you wrote it down it must be accepted as true i mean even right. in fiction people get people are upset about uh fictional stories because of the topics they cover and it's like well the whole point is that it's fiction <laughs> right uh, <laughs> <laughs> so give me an example uh well i'm just thinking of like uh in a, like in the u.s right now in the like the south people are burning uh, burning books by like famous authors, for example, the, this book, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Uh, and it has these like scenes of incest in it. Right. But of course it's Toni Morrison. Like I haven't read this book in a long time, but like the themes have purpose. Like this is a book with purpose She's exploring like intense themes. It's not just like gratuitous bad things happening to get your interest and to entertain you. Like she's exploring real topics like, right. like race and slavery in America. Um, and 
I guess, I guess where I'm going with this is like to respond to that by burning the book is just kind of ludicrous. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I'm forgetting how that circles back to what we were talking about, but it's just, yeah. I guess people accept it as just this face value, right? right? Like people read this book and they just see this bad thing happen and they're like, this bad thing happened. So this book is bad. <laughs> right, uh, right, right. Instead of being like, I'm a reader of this book. Who's like, needs to interpret it and consume it and think about what it might mean. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, so the, the, the next question is a big one. Uh, so this is something I've been thinking about for a while now, which is uh, a game based on crowdsourcing words. So what I'm thinking of is um, like, okay, so as you know, I love uh, words, and I, 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 I'm thinking of something, if you like, of creating a game where um, the audience or, you know, people you're playing with, they throw, each person throws a word, and then you have to do something with whatever you have with each word. So one example would be the, uh, the not sure if you saw the um the uh, the post that I shared with you it's about the uh, word cloud so I would the post um okay let me share my screen so I, yeah I got a this page can it be displayed message when I tried to pull it up okay so I'm gonna sh uh, share my screen now okay can you see my screen yeah so see this word cloud, what happened, yeah. is I, um, I on, a, uh, on a Facebook group, I asked people, just everyone, just um, say whatever word comes to your mind, right? And then people, somebody said love, some, some other people said music, other people said coffee, whatever, and then I created the word cloud from it. So this is the kind of the theme I'm going after, but I'm not really, you know, it's not as exciting as I want it to be, or, you know, I, I feel it's a half baked idea. I would like to fully bake it. So I yeah. just, your two cents. Well, if I were to just keep thinking about that idea, I mean, one way to do it would be to like supercharge the question, right? Like what are your emotions in response to this? And then like present them with something uh, or like what words come to mind in response to this. Uh, so you're starting to push it in like a direction a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and you'll get different clouds from that. Yeah. Yeah. I Can you change the shape of the clouds? Like, uh, I think I can. Yes. I like think. stretch them out or make them like thicker or like, I think I can, but it will have to do some technical stuff too. Cause that could be interesting too. Like, Maybe like a lighter topic is like a wispier cloud and a yeah. heavier topic is denser. And yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> or, um, or if you got like a cluster of clouds, that could be interesting, right? Like as you ask more and more questions and build more and more clouds, like you, you might have like a cluster that are related to a certain topic and you cluster those clouds together. Right. Have you ever used Ngram, Google Ngram? Yeah. Uh, check it out now. I don't know. When I saw this, I was like, wow, this is super cool. Uh, let's do this together. And that's, uh, I want you to share the screen. Uh, yeah. Invite. Uh, okay. Or I can share my screen. It doesn't matter. Oh, you want me to share my screen? Make a host. Yeah. Uh, I just want you to experiment with uh, Google and Gram. Google and Gram. So basically, you put a word, and then it gives you the 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 a graph for the history of its use. Google. What's it called? And Gram. I I put it in the chat. Oh, okay. Nope. This. N N G R A M. And, and oh got it yeah yeah so 
So yeah, just put any word you're interested in. Oh, interesting. And this is its appearance in a book? In books. In, in any in, book. Yeah, yeah, in, okay. In, Since we were talking about mastery. Yeah. Interesting. It's, I would have thought this part would be more extreme. Yeah. We were just talking about like how Malcolm, we felt like, or I thought that Malcolm Gladwell popularized this. Yeah. But I feel like this shows that if it was almost that high in the 30, in 1930, that if anything, he was exploring something that was already popular. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm forcing you to to enjoy something that you wouldn't enjoy, but I just love it. I love this kind of anything that's where, where you put a word and then you get a gap. I just like, I don't know. It just, I love this type of thing. Yeah, it's super fun. And I also uh, enjoy browsing through uh, thesaurus, thes thesauri. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, now you can, uh, okay, you can stop sharing your screen. Or you can... <laughs> Starting to have fun. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. How can this is a question I think a lot about a lot. How can you tell uh, that? Actually, I'm going to add a question that I haven't asked you. Uh, I haven't sent you. Uh, and uh, then we'll follow up with the one I sent you. How can you tell if somebody is uh, self-aware or not? Self-aware? Hmm. I mean... Where to begin? I, I guess... I feel like a, a really clear sign of self-awareness is actually like... people who connect quickly with other people because they're able to tell the impact they have mm. on the person they're with. Mm. And so I think because they, because they can like get that read on, on their self, they're able to like connect with other people more effectively. Okay. Um, now the question that I sent to you, and now I'll, I'll tell you why I'm connecting those questions. Um, no, the question I sent you is how do you tell if a person is honest or not? Oh yeah, I I was like sit, sitting with this question for a long time because I don't I don't know the answer uh, and I wish I did but I think I don't know I mean I think you have to build your own approach right like it's it's a little bit personal how do you tell if someone's honest because not everyone I don't think everyone can do the same the same thing like. Uh, an example might be like an introvert versus an extrovert and how you tell if someone's honest. Like I think an extrovert would really like, like seek to talk to that person and see how they respond. And I think an introvert might be more inclined to like sit back and take in information and maybe ask questions, um, which isn't really an answer. <laughs> as how about not you and Jet, not the conceptually, you, you, Evan, like in your past, have you ever wondered about, okay, this guy seems honest because, or this guy seems, you know, just take, uh, walk me through your thought process. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I think one sign is like someone who gives you, like, who tells you something you don't want to hear because they know it will help you. I think that's a great sign of honesty because like there's, I think a ton of people right now talk about how if you're honest, you should, you should give and expect nothing in return and, or, or like, that's just something you should do. And I think that's true, but I think like someone who's manipulative could easily do that. Uh, in order to make you feel comfortable or like feel like they're honest. 
but I think less people are willing to give you like tough feedback to help you grow and improve as a person. And I think people who are willing to do that tend to be like honest and genuine. Right. Now, the question is, why do you think I combine those two questions together? The question about um, self-awareness. Self yeah, well, I think, I think someone who, who's manipulative could be very self-aware and therefore very good at making you think <laughs> that they're honest might be one answer. Um, and then I think maybe this is what you're getting at. If you, if I'm a self-aware person, then I should be able to tell whether someone's being honest with me because I can compare what they say about me to like my self-conception. And I'll be more accurate. Actually, I was going, I was going at the reverse of the your first uh, answer. I'm gonna explain why. Uh, I just go, I'm gonna just close the window because it's a bit cold. Yeah. Okay. So one of the most, you know, um, interesting psychological theories and most uh, impactful in my life has been uh, cognitive dissonance. Um, and this is something I've been, you know, I've been thinking about dishonesty and quote unquote dishonest people and all of that stuff and honest people, and all, of, all of that you know, theme a lot. And what I feel is that the majority, the vast, you know, the, the, the majority of people who you would be inclined to call dishonest are not 100% like I'm gonna lie and uh, like cartoonish in a cartoonish way. Yeah. Always, they always justify to themselves in a way. In, in other ways, they always like create a story where the person they're, they're not lying to, uh, they're lying to is is actually the, the, the bad guy, or these find some reasons for their uh, dishonest. So I what I came to realize is that the before people are lie to each uh, to, to someone else, they have to lie to themselves. So the better you are at catching yourself lying to yourself, the less likely you are to be dishonest with other people. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, so that's what, and I was thinking of how can I, how can I, you know, how can I network with honest people? How can I find honest people? And I think this is one of the best indicators. If you, if you, if the person is honest with themselves, there's a good chance they would be honest with you. I think, you know, that's just my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. There, there might even be like how you were saying, if you're self-aware, um, what was it that you're saying? If you're self-aware, you recognize in yourself the lies you're telling yourself. Yes. Kind of thing. Um, yeah. There's almost like also with self-awareness, like you know yourself, you know your values, your beliefs. Uh, and so when you catch yourself lying to yourself, you might even be like more comfortable with that. And like, you might be better able to deal with those lies that you're telling yourself. Whereas someone who's less self-aware might still notice the lies they're telling themselves, but they don't know what to do with that or like, uh, or, or how that fits into like their bigger mental schema. Okay. Um, how are you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling good. Uh, okay. Because I, uh, I'm taking a, I'm taking a breath because this is, you know, I'm, I, I care very much about this topic and I've been thinking a, a bit, a lot about it. I watched a documentary recently about Conman 
uh, and out of it were like six people, like famous, famous six people. And out of the six people, only one was like super duper, like, yeah, I I ripped them off, and there's a uh, there's a you know great feeling when you rip people off, and and yeah, I I don't have feelings of guilt and all of that. Mo all of the others, I think, were like they always had kind of. Uh, ways to justify their behavior yeah uh, so I like, I, I, yeah i like the way you talked about it because i i feel like i jumped straight to the outliers like the people who are the absolute worst liars like the manipulators who maybe even have like a disorder that makes them lie um like maybe they like they have a zero empathy disorder or something like that but I like the way you're looking at it because you're saying like everyone really lies. Like no one is fully honest. Um, and that's like, I think a more interesting question is like on the, on the spectrum of people who are like your everyday honest to dishonest person, what makes you fall further toward the honest side than the dishonest side? And how does like self-awareness contribute to that? And, and I think that's like a, a really nice question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a really good, also, like, emotional intelligence topic to pursue. Uh, yeah. Let's write a book, uh, co-author a book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> future about it. Uh, okay. Okay, this is a, a creative uh, question, I think. So choose a fiction book and a non-fiction book, mix them together, and describe the results. Oh, jeez. Stay with it. <laughs> it's a big question yeah i'm gonna I'll, I'll just mix the last the last uh fiction book that i read with the last non-fiction book i read instead okay. instead of trying to uh to call like instead of cultivating a connection i'm gonna just like mix two and see what happens sure. Sure. so sure. the the last fiction book i read was called opioid indiana okay and it's about like a high school teenager he's coming of age in indiana which is like a, a small midwestern state in the yeah. united states yeah. um and it's about like the opioid crisis there uh like the addiction to opioids yeah. and the narrator is like just this hilarious guy who has like so many horrendous things happening to him in his like life but somehow you're like laughing the whole way through because because the narrator's so funny um and like ridiculous and so that's the fiction book i'm choosing and then the nonfiction. i read this book i've been working on writing summaries about nonfiction books for like my company's app and the last one i did was called leading from the middle and it's about uh being a manager who's in the middle between like your employees your boss and your peers and like how challenging that is to just have like information and feelings and interactions and conflicts on all these different levels every day um and also how it's like a really big opportunity though to learn and like collect data like you're in a unique position uh and that book like talked a lot about how middle managers actually like the psychological toll on them is bigger than almost any other level in companies. And I, I thought I was like, I, I found that really interesting. So, but anyways, now to connect the two. So opioid Indiana was a fairly short book. Like I want to say like 200 pages. So I think if we, I think if we intersected them, we'd have to create like an epic novel, like maybe 500 pages. And, uh, and it's this narrator, the narrator's entire life. So the book ends with the narrator basically becoming addicted to opioids as it is now. And so I think the second half of this book would have to be the narrator as a middle manager at a big American corporation addicted to opioids but like, and barely, just barely hanging on to his job. Uh, and like, yeah, <laughs> so th that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking of something along the lines of like, 
uh, somebody seeking opioids just to relieve the, the, the pain of uh, middle management. Uh, yeah, or here we go. He's a, he's a middle manager at a big pharma, pharmaceutical company. Right. That's responsible <laughs> for the opioid crisis. Uh, and right. addicted to opioids. Right. <laughs> I read that book. <laughs> okay. So uh, the next question is, how are we similar and how are we different? <laughs> I mean, I think... I can see a lot of similarities. Uh, obviously, I'm speculating because we've, we've met a few times. Um, so if you disagree, cut, cut me off because I'd love to yeah, hear. Part of the game is the speculation. That's the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think from our interactions, I see you as like really passionate about learning, writing, and researching. Um, you seem to love stories and ideas. I think you like intersecting disciplines. Um, and I think like more generally on like a personality level, I think you're very like curious and you like having fun and like laughing. And I think those are all things that I also, um, do and like, so that's where I see overlap. If I were to guess, I'll just venture a guess at a difference. I think you might be an extrovert. And I might, and, and I know I'm an introvert. That, that would be like the big difference that I was thinking maybe, because you seem like really good at networking and like reaching out to other people and I'm not. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Uh, no, that's very interesting that you said that because that's actually in the back, uh, you know, story of the podcast uh, of this series i was saying that lots of people some people kind of like classify me as an extreme ex extrovert and think of me of that and other people think of me as very introverted and both of them they get surprised when they see the other side of me uh, okay so if i did for the majority of my life like if i did a, uh, um any type type of personality assessments which i'm you know uh, skeptical of, but I would consider I, the result would be introvert. But okay. I'm kind of like I consider myself an ambivert, uh, somewhere in between. Yeah. But uh, I, yeah. yeah. Like if it were a spectrum from one to ten, and um, like ten's an ext like extreme extrovert and one is an extreme introvert, would you say you're a five then, or like? Yeah, but but I'm a five in the sense that I do things that are nine and I, I do things that are two. You know what I'm saying? Oh, interesting. It's not that, like, I I have, I'm almost like, if, if that's something, uh, like, like bipolar in terms of my ex extroversion and introversion. Like, what, like, I'm extreme, like, if I'm working and I'm writing, I really have to have zero noise around me. Like, if the clock is sticking, I have to take off the batteries. Because, you know, I, I have to concentrate. So this is kind of a, like a very introverted uh, trait. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm I kind of like a weird mixture of both. Uh, um, but, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting that you said that. Um, okay. Uh, speaking of critiques... Uh, <laughs> We haven't mentioned critiques, but because we talked before that, I knew you about critiques. Um, what is a very helpful critique that you received? I think the best critique I ever got was in my creative writing like program. And I wrote this short story and I workshopped it. And people had like a lot of different critiques of it. And then two months later, I rewrote it and workshopped it again. And my professor was like, I'm going to be honest. I feel like you lost like the magic that was in this story in the first draft. Like it's gone. Uh, and I think it's because you tried to take everyone's critiques too seriously. Mm. And sometimes 
when someone critiques a specific part of your story, instead of adjusting to match their critique, you should do the opposite. And so if they're like, I don't like this for this reason, like triple or quadruple down on your intention with that scene. So like, and then they'll see like, like maybe the problem is that they don't see it the way you're seeing it. And what you need to do is make it more extreme and like lean into that, that quirk or like, uh, that thing that people that's rubbing people the wrong way to show that, like, to like, and then they might actually come around to it when you like make it more extreme. And so to slow my answer down, it's like when like, or make it more concise when someone critiques you, sometimes the best response is to do the thing that they're critiquing more extremely. That is fascinating. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Can you give me the specific, uh, you know, thing in question in your uh, novel that was, that he suggested you double down on? Yeah, it was, so it was like, there was this one scene and what was it? and there was like the the scene was this whale washing up in a lagoon mm. and people were like were like critiquing the believability of it like they were like this wouldn't happen or like or like uh there's like not enough here for this to be a story or like uh they're like the meaning behind this is unclear kind of thing and i think the first time i rewrote it i tried to be like really clear about why the whale was there and like the science behind like how a whale could wash up in a lagoon that was like because they critiqued the believability and so my answer was to like think about all the details and try to make it as believable as possible. Um, but I lost this sort of like magical feeling of what it would be like to wake up and go for a walk in a lagoon and suddenly see this giant whale like blocking the path <laughs> because the tide receded in the whale, you know? Um, and so the answer was to like make it like almost crazier and more like lean into like the description more than the details of the like how it's possible wow so you ended up doing that did you yeah okay and you were both kind of like content with the final uh product well i i i was content i don't know because it was my last submission to that workshop so then like I edited it out of my class, but I, 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 I am in awe. I, wow, this is amazing. I love it. <laughs> love it. Uh, maybe I, you know, after that, I'll just go and kind of like, cause I'm very, uh, you know, intrigued about the idea of extremes. And I think extremes always, uh, not, I don't like the word always, a lot of the time, the point towards talent. Uh, so I don't think, I don't like when people try to water down extremes. I think extremes are good and they should kind of like be um, used instead of like toned down. So anyways, we're, we're getting into talent now, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, cool. Very cool. Uh, okay, let's uh, move to the next one. Why are some writers bad speakers and some bad speakers bad uh some good speakers bad writers if it's both words if we're all kind of yeah i mean the obvious overlap is like a speech can be written and so you would think like, i'm just trying to think about it like logically so like actually a, a, like a reading is a really good way of thinking of it. So like two writers who are, I will say equally good could write a story each and one of them could be awesome to listen to read their story and the other can be less good, even though their story is a great story. 
Um, and I think we can like talk about some of the reasons that might happen. I, I don't think there's one answer, but I think one thing would be emotional connection with your audience. And so when you're talking about a story, like some stories are better read out loud because it, it could be different qualities. Like for example, like stories that have more dialogue tend to be read really well out loud. And I think that's because there's like an emotional appeal to it. The words are written to sound as though they're spoken. So it's very engaging on that level. Um, whereas something that's very descriptive, <laughs> like if it's like a long scene describing like a beautiful uh, landscape, that could be a lot harder to listen to and visualize. Um, and so now that, that was just kind of like a small example, but if I were to say like bigger picture, I think a bad, like a writer who's a bad speaker might just lack the ability to like engage an audience, to connect with an audience emotionally, things like that. Uh, and then even more generally, they're just skill sets, right? Like, uh, you can really work hard to develop your writing skills and not work very hard to develop those skills in speaking, like the skills of connecting with an audience, take, like avoiding saying like, um, like those quirks, you know, there's all those little things that someone who speaks a lot works on ironing out and perfecting and someone who doesn't d just doesn't do the work. And so it becomes obvious. Right, right, right. right. Okay, uh, why is writing, oh, the first question is, do you find writing painful? Um, second, you know, follow to that, why is writing painful for a lot of people? Yeah, I think of writing as type two fun is my answer. Uh, type two fun being like running a marathon or uh, climbing a mountain, like these kind of things where they're, they're incredibly challenging and painful, but the journey itself is worth it. And like, like the pain is like a pleasurable kind of pain of like, you know, your pain has purpose. And so to me, that's, that's how I think about writing. I think I mean, if I'm sitting down at a blank page, like it's like anyone who says that's not painful is crazy, but, but like the pain is worth it because when you like finish something or when you work at something, you're exploring ideas, you're learning and you're like growing as a person. So, so why do you think it's painful to begin with? It takes a lot of energy. Uh, you have to, when you like explore an idea or a topic, you'll inevitably run into like gaps in your thought process where you'll realize like, like an example of a painful writing is when you set out to write one thing and halfway through you realize all the ways you're wrong <laughs> or all the ways that like your idea is not that interesting is even worse. Uh, and like grappling with that and making it interesting or like addressing those counter arguments is like painful. <laughs> it's hard. And like, uh, you want to just be naturally interesting and engaging and stylish and all these things, but you're not. <laughs> so I think that, I think that's part of the pain. Um, okay. We, we already kind of discussed the uh, organizing your thoughts. Um, so what are some words you love and words that you hate? I think I, I really hate the word it, like IT, and the word thing, because I write them all the time and they just get in the way. They're not descriptive. They're like kind of a dot, they're a classic way to dodge thinking clearly, like how we talked about clarity earlier. And so I think I hate those words, like as a writer, because I know that they're traps. And when I see them, 
it means I'm going to have some work to do <laughs> to figure out how to say something more clear and, and uh, more meaningful. And words you love? I love like um, words for emotions. So I think like, uh, I don't know, have you seen any of those like dictionaries of emotion words where they, they get into like how different languages have words for emotions that other languages don't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I get so really get really into that because I think I think it's just fascinating how we kind of like build our emotions uh, right. societally and right. how some of them even change over time. Like, uh, uh, what were some of those examples? There's like words in English that have like a positive opposite, but in time they lost the positive opposite. So like, um, Maybe if I look, pull up a word thing, I'll, I'll think of one. Uh, I can't remember the exact example, but I'm thinking of like, like a word like detestable. And I don't think this is actually true, but like, if it had an English opposite, that was like testable. Right. And that was like a positive thing that like people, it meant like, it meant like people felt like, uh, like they could like approach you like if you were like approachable and you know the opposite right. of detestable and there's words like that where where there's an opposite but it see like society just stopped using it and so right. it, it like right. stopped existing and I, I don't know I find that really fascinating because all of a sudden you're like seeing language as connected to like emotional experiences right and right. and like why did why did that word drop away from away from our language like why yeah. did this positive emotion word drop away and like what would the world be like if we still used it yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah I, uh, sometimes i wonder these things the, this reminds of something i somebody sent me um recently which is uh, an author created a bunch of words to describe feelings uh, that we have, but there's no there's no word for it. I'm gonna send. Oh, cool. Did did you did you hear what I just last said? Because I'm on mute. I don't know if you were. Um. No. I. You before you went on mute, you said that it's like a list of words that he invented. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Because there's no words for it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Evan, the thing is that now we uh, are uh, uh, 90 minutes in. I am so fine with continuing on, but I want to uh, respect your time as well. So, I'm going to leave you with the option of either continuing on or either uh, and or, or taking a break or just leaving it there. Uh, what's left is the questions that are chosen, you chose. Um, okay. Uh, another um, five uh, hidden questions and then uh, my uh, your question to me. So just do whatever you, you feel like uh, doing. Yeah, I, so I have a meeting at in 15 minutes. So how about we do like 10 more minutes of questions and sure. then I'll jump off. So I have a chance to like use the bathroom and get some sure. water before my next meeting. <laughs> sure. Sounds good. And if you want, you can, we can do, take the break now, uh, as you wish. I mean, I can pause the recording and we, as you, whatever you feel like.
No, let's just uh let's let's do like however many questions we can get through in the next uh, okay. in the next 10 minutes here. Sure. Okay. So we reached the section where you uh, uh, I gave you a list of questions and then you chose uh, some of them. Uh, um, yeah. So the questions were uh, how uh, sec. Uh, okay, so uh, an op opportunity that you said no to. Okay, yeah, I'll go through that one fast because, yeah, my um, when I when I recently switched, like, working positions, I like when I switched companies, I got a counter offer, and the counter offer like kind of like vaguely included the opportunity to write other books which is something that I've always wanted to do. And I ultimately said no, because it wasn't concrete. <laughs> like, like there was no like concrete opportunity. It was like, um, yeah, it was sort, right. sort of like um, vague or potential, but not real. And right. I also, I just, I had reached a point where I think I wanted to like expand my horizons beyond, beyond that job and just experience something else. Right, right. Makes sense. Um, okay, tell me about the Eureka moment you had. Yeah, I think, like, sadly, I, I don't have a ton of Eureka moments, because they're just, I think a lot of my Eureka moments are, like, kind of micro. Like, it's yeah. like, I, I do these, like, big drafts, and then I go through and I tweak little things and like as i tweak i come to these like mini eurekas that like add up to something bigger um but the best example of this i can think of was i was working on my like recent novel and i didn't know what i wanted the last part to be like this last section of pages i didn't know how long i wanted it to be i didn't know what i wanted to happen and i read this it was like this poet writing sort of fiction. It was like sort of this like, it was fiction, but it would be like only like 10 lines in a page. Like it was like really open and uh, experimental. And I read that, I can't remember the name of the work. I'll have to, I'll send it to you after when, um, when I pull it up. But looking at it, I was suddenly like, I know exactly what I want to do for part three of my novel. And I, it wasn't the same structure as what I was reading It's completely different, but like just looking at like the openness of it and the way it was structured, I was like, I want something that feels that light and that, uh, easy to read or something, but at the same time, like complicated. And so I, I came up with this idea to do like sort of a short story as my last section of my novel um, and use like, like draw from the mystery genre to like play around with uh, for just that last 15 pages. And, and it, uh, after I came up with that idea, I wrote those 15 pages in like two weeks uh, because I just, it was kind of like a classic Eureka moment where I just saw exactly what I wanted to do and I did it. Right, right, right. Okay, so tell me a game that you like, a game that you don't like, and uh, whether there's a relationship between those things and your kind of career or yeah. to enjoy or don't enjoy. Well, I love surfing. It's like my favorite game. I guess you could call it a game. And something that's always bugged me is like people do these imitation books of where they take like a famous writer like Emily Dickinson. And then they create these, like, they're like poems about, a, they're like a contemporary take on the poem. And I think it bugs me because it like oversimplifies what it used to be to make a joke. And like, they can be funny. I'm not, I don't like totally dislike them or something. Like I find them funny, but after I read a few, it starts to like wear on me. And I feel like, they're cheapening something that someone spent like so much time creating. Like it's almost like taking someone else's creation and 
like making a joke out of it for your for your own work uh and and that like really bugged me but uh, what was the follow-up it's like what'd you say it was like what so how does this uh you know how does the career uh, uh game um intersect not intersect is there a is there a relationship between what you the things that you like in a sport versus things that you like in a uh in a career in a scale. oh yeah yeah well i think um like surfing is really authentic and raw and there's not really like a way to fake it like you have to just be yourself like it's visceral it's in the moment you're reacting to your environment and i think like it's very real and tangible and i think there's something about like taking someone else's work and like create like making it into something you can sell that to me feels like removed from yourself like it's like maybe not true to yourself gotcha okay okay um uh, if you're an animal what kind of animal would you be <laughs> i would be a, a brown pelican because they're like they're very graceful and playful and they spend like their whole life on the sea fishing Uh, and there's also, a, a, isn't there a publishing house called Pelican something? Yeah, yeah. I forget, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you achieve great, uh, uh, you know, great marketing without being known? Being a great marketer without you yourself being known? Yeah, I, I would think, like, the first thing that comes to mind is Cormac McCarthy, the writer. Uh, he's, like, basically refused to ever even do an interview. And I think his marketing is just his work itself. Like he created great work. And so it's like the classic organic spread of people reading it and then telling other people to read it. Um, and then of course he has the benefit of like, he publishes his book. So there are people marketing it other than him. Uh, but he had to write good enough work to get other people to market it. And I think that would be my answer. If you want to achieve great marketing success without being known for it, you're probably creating something that other people then market. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, because I do think there's like a human aspect of marketing. Right. Um, so there are three minutes left. Do you want uh, to ask me a question perhaps, or we can end it here? Oh, I have so many questions for you. Uh, what are some of your like recent books you've read that are your favorites? Uh, so the one that pops out is uh, Adam Grant's book, uh, Think Again. Oh, nice. Like his uh, new one? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's Think Again or Rethink or whatever. It's just, just the importance of, uh, uh, you know, uh, questions and, and, and rethinking uh, what you've done. Uh, and I found it very refreshing because throughout my life I kind of like um, struggled in the sense that people wanted answers from me or, or the careers wanted answers from me uh, and I always was very either skeptical, hesitant and all of that stuff um, and he, he just gave me kind of like more a, a, a stronger nudge to kind of like appreciate this tendency and see it as an advantage. Uh, so according to him, people who doubt themselves uh, should, ex if that's true, if people who doubt themselves uh, should expect, you know, should expect great things to happen. So he expect me to be have a very, very bright future uh, based on <laughs> Adam Grant's work. <laughs> so yeah, I would say that. Uh, so yeah, thank you very, very much, Evan. I really, really enjoyed this and uh, yeah me too uh, we we should definitely do something more more of whatever it is together yeah yeah i'd love to all right i will stop now stop recording